You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. And I have uh, Christopher Frankemeyer, the PhD student at the Johannes Gutenberg University, Mainz, uh, the Institute for Molecular Biology and the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. So, Christopher, thank you for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How about you? Good, good. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I found you because um, I saw you're part of a group that uh, is creating a synthetic organelle that will be inside of living cells, if I have it right. Can you tell me a little bit about yeah. um, what's what's recently happened? Yes, yeah, so uh, we recently published the synthetic organelle. So uh, the idea for a synthetic organelle is that it can do a specific translation of uh, one mRNA to produce uh, a specifically modified protein. Um, and uh, this um, specifically modified protein carries then a non-canonical amino acid as a specific site. So there has already previously been established a technique of genetic code expansion where you uh, recode, a, for example, a stop codon in your protein coding sequence to put a non-canonical amino acid. Um, and we now developed an organelle based on um, phase separation and uh, microtubule motor proteins to um, create an organelle which only recruits one mRNA and then only translates this mRNA with an expanded genetic code so that only this uh, specific mRNA carries the modification or the protein which comes from this okay. mRNA. So most organelles in the cell do a crazy amount of things, like let's say a ribosome, but yours is ultra specific where it only creates one thing. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So um, our organelle only creates this one uh, protein, basically. So uh, to do this, so one concept we uh, rely heavily on is the concept of phase separation, which has in recent years gotten a lot of attention in cell biology, uh, because there are a lot of uh, membraneless organelles which organize things. So uh, maybe all the traditional organelles you think of, like mitochondria or the nucleus, uh, they are all membrane encapsulated. But uh, proteins can also form membraneless organelles, which you can imagine like when you mix oil and water, they won't mix and you will have oil droplets in water or vinegar when you for example, make a, a, a dressing for a salad or something like that. So this is also a principle with cells use because then in this oil droplet in the water, the um, oil is very highly concentrated. This also happens for proteins. And so what we do is we concentrate um, the components to make the expanded genetic code, which are the, the tRNA synthetase, the tRNA, and the mRNA for protein of choice into a concentrated phase so that really only this mRNA gets this non-canonical amino acid by the tRNA. Well, okay, well, let's go over a little bit of basics just for listeners in case. So organelles are components inside of a cell that do things like the ribosome, you know, I guess creates proteins, you have the nucleus, you have uh, mitochondria, et cetera. So you're trying to create a essentially a synthetic one that has just one purpose as proof of concept. And then later on, and I'm sure you'll expand if this works. Um, I, I do have a question. Yeah. I've, I've thought about this. Um, you know, if you think of the body, the skin is like a membrane. It keeps the insides in, the outsides out. Then you have different parts of the body, like the, you know, I guess the peritoneum keeps the organs in, you know, the stomach area. And then the organs themselves have, uh, you know, linings and cells to keep things in and out. And then cells have, you know, linings, the membranes to keep stuff in and out. What about organelles? What what does the surface of an organelle look like? Does it have a membrane? Like how does it keep a separate self inside of the cell cytoplasm? And how did you guys create a um, a boundary that keeps your synthetic organelle in its own place inside the cell without 
you know, being dissolved or without uh, interacting with the rest of the cell. Mm -hmm. uh, so inside the cell, there are basically uh, two different kinds of organelles. Um, one are, um, again, like a cell encapsulated in a membrane. So these are the more classical organelles like mitochondria have a membrane or also um, uh, the Golgi apparatus, which modifies proteins. They all have a membrane and uh, they have um, things concentrated inside of the membrane, but they always need to transport machinery. Then there are other organelles in cells like, for example, the nucleolus or for example, stress granules, which uh, are called membrane-less organelles because they uh, form inside of the cell by interaction of uh, proteins and RNA. So they basically, without being enclosed by a membrane, they um, form by intramolecular, um, intermolecular interactions between RNAs and proteins, for example, and they locally concentrate uh, specific components. And they uh, dynamically exchange with the surrounding cytoplasm because they are not surrounded by membranes. So basically everything which is in the cytoplasm has potentially access to this, but uh, the different affinities between proteins and RNAs determine how concentrated um, components are inside of these membraneless organelles. And this is exactly what we hmm. now use to create this synthetic organelle. Um, so, in the non-membrane uh, organelles, do they, how do they stay fixed in the cell, or do they, or do they migrate throughout the cell? Like when I think of the cell nucleus, are, I don't think of it. I uh, think of it just sitting in the center. But does it migrate? So uh, the cell nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle, but there's a structure inside of the nucleus, oh. which is the nucleolus, and this is membrane-less. And uh, these specific structures are very dynamic. So in general, a lot of these. Um, Membraneless organelles, they uh, can form, for example, in response to stress, and they can uh, form, grow, and then also dissolve again. So they are very dynamic. And they are, I think when you compare, for example, to the traditional membrane bound, they are uh, even more dynamic than these ones. So they uh, move a lot in cells, and they grow and can shrink. Okay. So they migrate, they grow, they shrink, et cetera. Gotcha. Yeah. So the synthetic organelle that you made, what... You tell me a little bit about what it does. It was, a, you know, pretty technical. But what what is the point? What are you tr trying to do? What um, mechanism or pathway within the cell, or what role or what function does this organelle serve? Uh, so the purpose of our organelle is to uh, put really specific modifications into proteins. So this technology of genetic code expansion can be used, for example, to put um, reactive amino acids into a protein at a specific site, and then you can afterwards then react your protein with, for example, what we often do is with a, with a fluorescent dye so that you can um, label your protein and uh, use this for microscopy, for example, for super resolution microscopy, or uh, because this technique has been around for already, uh, so this genetic code expansion technology has been around for um, more than 20 years, there are a lot of different amino acids which can be put into a protein. And with this, you can, for example, get photo control of a protein and you can just um, then activate a protein when you shine light on it or something like that, or put specific uh, post and cell modifications. So these are like three common uh, applications of this technology. But what we can now do is we can make sure that this only happens for one of the mRNAs in the cell and that only one protein gets modified. So that you, uh, when you then want to label your protein, for example, for microscopy, you can be sure that only the protein you want to study is actually labeled with the fluorescent dye afterwards. But why do this inside a cell? Why not just make like a, you know, a cell-sized organelle that can do this and just, you know, put it in the body itself? Why do it inside of a cell? So the point uh, why we do this inside of a cell is so that we can study the protein in its natural environment. So with the technique before, you can already easily purify a protein and then um, have the protein modified. But this is then just purified, and you can do in vitro experiments with it. But if we really want to understand um, a protein in its natural context, what it's actually doing, it's always good when you can do this inside a cell or uh, inside an organism. So uh, therefore, oh. it's better when you can do this incorporation in a uh, eukaryotic cell if you want to study a eukaryotic protein. But this wouldn't be a solution. This wouldn't be a therapy where you'd somehow get a synthetic organelle into all the cells of the body or all the cells of a specific tissue. Or is that one of the goals, just not now? Well, I think that's a bit uh, very much preliminary because this is uh, what we are doing is at the very much of the beginning of uh, what you can do with this um, technology for the um, 
genetic code expansion. So we only use it to expand this for genetic code to uh, use this as a cell biological tool. Um, I guess there would be still, if you're thinking about medical applications, there would be still a lot of more development be necessary to do that. Okay. So you've you've run this experiment and uh, has it worked? And what have you observed from from running it? If so, so uh, what um, we observed is when we actually combine these um, two components. One is the phase separating component, and one is a, a microtubule motor protein which uh, moves along microtubules. That we actually really are able to inside cells form these big synthetic organelles, and that these synthetic organelles can still perform the very complex task of translating a protein. And this um, also with the expanded genetic code so that you basically then have uh, still your housekeeping proteins are translated with the normal genetic code of the 20 amino acids and only your protein of interest is basically translated with a second genetic code which has then the uh, non-canonical amino acid on top and can then be specifically modified. And this, to our surprise, works actually surprisingly well. So we get... Um, between like the uh, around like tenfold selectivity in our organelle, although it's membraneless and can still exchange with the surrounding cytoplasm, and we still get uh, a relatively high efficiency and selectivity for the protein we want to produce. And this will, works for a bunch of different proteins. And how do you get this uh, this stuff into the cell? Do you have to inject it, or you found a way for the cell to naturally engulf it and take it in? Um, so uh, we work with tissue culture cell lines, uh, and uh, we just uh, use uh, transiently tr uh, a transient transfection with uh, plasmid DNA, and then the cells produces the proteins which form the organelle itself, and also does all the other steps. So we can just uh, so these transient transfections you just uh, put your plasmid, and then you put a chemical reagent on this, and then it's just taken up by the cells. Interesting. So it's taken up by the cells. So you you observe it go through the cell membrane migrate to somewhere inside the cell and then start working? Yeah, so so because we just put uh, plasma DNA, uh, it's then uh, transcribed and translated by the cell and the cell makes all the proteins which we need to uh, form the organelles. So this is a molecular biology is a relatively standard uh, tool to do uh, these transient transfections where you just uh, basically express uh, a protein inside the mammalian cells using a plasmid for this. Okay. So again, what what have you observed by observing um, this functionality inside the cell? Anything different from what you expected, or is there really no difference? Um, well, in terms of uh, because our experiments are usually um, are relatively short term, so we didn't uh, see something like toxicity or uh, unhealthy effects on the cells so far. Um, for this, you would need for like a longer stable expression of this, but. Uh, this is for the genetic core expansion field always a bit uh, difficult to achieve. So uh, in our short term of the experiment, the cells look uh, healthy and we are able to do the selective expression of uh, the protein we want to express. Okay. So what, what would be the next stage in this experiment now that you've, uh, you've done this? What, uh, you know, where do you go from here? So um, the next uh, stage is to actually further optimize this. So this is now the uh, first first step where we showed that we can get selective expression. But um, what we use so far is, for example, we use uh, big phase separating proteins, which are also naturally occurring in cells. And uh, they are um, involved probably when you express them for long term, they might not be that healthy because they are also involved in some new degenerative diseases like ALS, for example. So what we try now is to minimize our phase separating system so that this is really um, develops into a really healthy like uh, organelle structure in the cell so that ideally at some point uh, you can just use it as a uh, add-on organelle which is completely healthy for the cell and you can just use this organelle to design, uh, to express whatever protein you want with a second genetic code so that you uh, get special proteins produced in your cell. Okay. Would, um, has this given you an understanding of how the other organelles inside the cell work? Or um, you know any insights into how um, you know DNA is transcribed, or how proteins are made, or you know, what are some ancillary learnings that you've gotten that uh, maybe you didn't anticipate? Well, I think definitely for the um, phase separation field, this is um, one of the first papers which showed that you can actually design an organ which can do a really complex task. Because so when you imagine translation, 
this is uh, for your cells one of the most complex things they have to do. So you need uh, hundreds of different molecules to work together to actually produce a protein which includes different tRNAs, the ribosomes, a bunch of translation factors, and uh, that you can actually synthetically put this into an organelle which then does something more with this translation machinery uh, was actually for us quite surprising because um, when you um, think of this, uh, we just put five components into the cell, we get this organelle, and then uh, we can actually really um, recruit all the other components to make a, a full functional protein biomolecule. And uh, I think this is uh, also, so this organelle, we now use this for genetic expansion, but conceptually um, the principle that you can in a membraneless compartment uh, concentrate factors can also be used for a lot of other stuff which you can think of like where you maybe want to uh, treat RNAs differently or you want to um, perform enzymatic reactions more efficiently they can all potentially benefit from um, designing a synthetic organelle where you can then have a synthetic like reaction reactor in your cell to perform a certain task you're interested in more efficiently hmm. okay That's very interesting so what um, what's ahead for the next six months or a year with the work, or is it going to be years before you really uh, are at a point where you think you understand what's going on inside the cell a lot more? Um, so I I guess for this at the moment, we are still actually, um, as I already mentioned, we are surprised that this uh, with the simple components actually works that well. So uh, we are obviously uh, working on improving this further to get a really um, the most healthy system we can think of. And also, which would obviously be also be for us be very good is when we with this can get a really good um, cell line which can does this all the time and not only when you transit the transfectors to to make this uh, um, stable but this is at, at the moment still turns out to be not working that well so this is something we uh, need to further work on so that we can have a cell line which can do this orthogonal translation uh, permanently oh so your goal would be to have a permanent structure inside of uh what, what okay so I'm, I'm assuming what your goals are. What's your big ambitious goal for doing this? You know, what do you hope that would happen? What would be ideal? So what I would hope what would, ha would happen would be that um, uh, this um, organelle, which we have at the moment, uh, can be long-term stable in the cell, be uh, constantly this orthogonal translating organelle so that you have one space in the cell where you can basically operate a second genetic code, which is distinct from the normal genetic code, so you, your cell can still perform everything um, with the normal genetic code which it needs to survive and to be happy. And you have then just an add-on organelle where you can then um, produce special proteins with special functionalities uh, so that you can modify your protein however you want. Hmm. Okay, yeah, very good. So what's the best way for uh, people to learn more and to get in touch with uh, questions or you know, to request papers or submit papers, et cetera? How do they interact with you? So the best way to uh, reach us is either over the um, web page of my group, which uh, of uh, the group which I'm in, which is uh, um, at uh, the Lemke Lab. So either Google the Lemke Lab in Heidelberg or go over the website of the Institute, which is the EMBL Heidelberg, so embl.de. And when you go over research, you can then find the Lemke Lab. And that's the best way to get in touch with us and also find uh, our recent publications to this. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thanks for talking about this. It's, it's kind of crazy avant-garde stuff. But, uh, very, very interesting. You know? Thanks a lot. It was really interesting. <laughs>